Welcome into the rebirth of the KSO show. Mason Voth, Derek Young from K State Online, part of the On Three Network, here with you. As uh, this is this is the kickoff of all the the new and exciting content that will be coming the way, uh, whichever way you're listening to it, whether it's the YouTube or podcasting or just straight on the site, you're picking up these videos from there. Uh, today, as it's the Wednesday after Chris Simon's first. I'll call it in-season press conference because it's a uh, true, you know, preparing for an opponent type deal. We'll give a little breakdown of, of some of the major things he said, what they mean to us, what we think that they mean to the team. And uh, it's, it's never going to be anything, I, I think, that goes too terribly long, but kind of a nice way to cap and, and break down what he said, because as we know in the sports world, coach speak is a real thing. And uh, sometimes you need a little translation as to, to what's going on there. I always reference there was a, a Saturday Night Live sketch one time when Charles Barkley hosted, and it was making fun of pitching an app where it was like translating what athletes said after games. And it was basically calling out how, yeah, they're not saying this, but this is what they actually mean. And they're throwing these people under the bus or whatever. So uh, I don't know that we'll throw anybody under the bus, but we will hit on some of the major topics. So uh, we'll just start from the, the beginning and probably the thing that was. I think most pertinent in everybody's mind heading into yesterday, and that was an update on the injury situation for a couple of key figures in all of this. Christian Duffy is a big one. Daniel Green is a big one. And then up front, there was also some concern about Uso Sayamalo. And I think that the depth chart on Monday gave us a little insight into how they were feeling about certain guys. But then Chris Kleiman made it a little bit more clear yesterday. Well, first, welcome to K-State Online, obviously. This is your first appearance in that uh, position. So glad, uh, obviously, to have you on board. Second, I think we also probably need a, someone to translate Charles Barkley as well. I don't know. If True, that yes. Is. He, he can translate the athletes, and then we can translate what he may, may be trying to say. On the injury front, I think that's probably the biggest takeaway from this week is who's available, who's not. Not necessarily for this game, but what it might mean going forward when, you know, according to some, maybe that group of five game that's kind of been a little bit of a bugaboo for Chris Kleiman in his tenure in Manhattan, uh, it could be tricky when you play Troy. And then obviously you're going to have a Missouri team that's probably out for revenge at this point, uh, depending on if the the locker room in Columbia reflects the the media approach to that game, that might be the game they circle the most this year. So that'll be interesting road trip. And you're, you're going to want a, a full stable of personnel for that game, specifically Uso Sayamalo and Daniel Green, and obviously Christian Duffy at right tackle as well. The only thing that Chris Kleiman was willing to do, and obviously a lot of you probably have learned this information through our various ways of distributing content in the last 24 to 36 hours, is that Christian Duffy is – really the only one that he was willing to rule out for the, the Saturday season opener against SEMO. I almost said Southeast Missouri State, but they are very adamant that they would rather be called SEMO at this point. So we'll play along with the Red Hawks on that front. So definitely won't have Christian Duffy. It sounds like we may be getting at least a little bit of Daniel Green, maybe all of Daniel Green. Not only was he on the depth chart, which was a little bit of a surprise, he's been practicing, I think, longer. Then Uso Sayamalo, who also returned to practice this week. Seth Porter also returned to practice this week. But more than anything, I think I think the target date for Christian Duffy all along has been the Missouri game, game three out of the gate. So I, I think I would be a little surprised if he also saw the field against Troy. But I think I'm already optimistic just the, the way that they've been approaching it and discussing it about Daniel Green. I, I just None of these are long-term, but that one seems to be wrapping up and not even um, something that's on the radar at this point. Uh, it wouldn't shock me if Daniel Green's even close to hundred percent on Saturday. I think that's, I think he's, I don't know that that was always the case, but it's, it's apparent that he's way ahead of schedule. Uso sounds like ahead of schedule too. Chris Kleiman wasn't confident that he would practice this week. And then he shared at his Tuesday press conference that uh, Uso is going to practice today. And I didn't think that that was going to be the case. So, um, just going by those timelines, I don't know that Uso plays on Saturday. I wouldn't rule it out, um, but I don't think it's a certainty. But at this point, if he's already ready in for practice, you know, middle of SEMO week, I would think he would at least, if not against SEMO, get his first taste against Troy. And I think that's the big takeaway because, I mean, no offense to Christian Duffy. I really feel good about the offensive line probably no matter what. I'd rather have Christian Duffy than not Christian Duffy. Don't get me wrong, but I think – 
And because I'm comfortable with where Daniel Green is at and his recovery from what it sounds like, it's it's Uso that probably is receiving my full attention at this point. Yeah, and I think based off the way everything has seemed, or at least how I've put together pieces in my head since we kind of started to, to learn that there may be some injury concerns for these three guys, it's always come to me as, hey, make sure that they're ready to go for Missouri if they're going to be healthy in the first three weeks of the season. And anybody that plays before that, it likely means that they are close to 100% or that you feel pretty good about what they're going to be able to do and not get re-injured. And so I'm with you. The vibe I get is that Daniel Green will be out there on Saturday. And then you can be more cautious with Uso if you, if you want to. And then – Christian Duffy, that's kind of the one that I've just written off based off how they've discussed this. There's no reason in my eyes to throw him out there before the Missouri game because you feel like you should be able to handle Simo and Troy with that stable of offensive linemen that is really talented. Yeah, that's probably something to keep in mind or, or at least watch kind of the game within the game in the opener uh, that probably were – kind of glossed over a little bit just how Carl Willis looks so like is he is he ready for the prime time can he play right tackle can he hold up you know you know start to finish so I think that's an interesting item because he's going to be the replacement for Christian Duffy um but yeah in an ideal world I would like to see Uso at least for the Troy game just to maybe get his feet wet before you play Missouri but more than anything having all these three back from Missouri has to be the priority um I think, I think the typical fan thinks that Kansas State can just wax Missouri again. I mean, after all, last year was a, a pretty simple endeavor to do so. Uh, Missouri didn't put up up anything really. I mean, Kansas State didn't even play good and won the game forty. To yeah, 12. that was before K State knew they could throw the ball last year. Yeah, K State didn't know that they could throw the ball. I think that was a pretty good Philip Brooks game as well. So in the in the return game, I, I but I just feel like. I'm not saying it's going to be the reverse. I almost said that. This is not going to be the reverse, but I think it's they're going to have to go and win it in Columbia. Uh, it will not be given to them where they can kind of just casually scroll in and win by four touchdowns the way they did last year. I agree with that. And one last thing on the offense, the injury and offensive line. You mentioned Carver Willis. You know, you said, can he play right tackle? I think that's a question as old as time for K-State football lore is, can he play tackle? So we will find out the answer to that question uh, this weekend, most likely. Another thing that was notable yesterday from Chris Kleiman that also has a lot of people's interest, probably even more so because you're going into a game against an FCS. Outside of the year, Skylar Thompson got hurt against Southern Illinois. K-State has handled these FCS opponents pretty easily. You can get the backups into the game. And so the backup quarterback situation was brought up. It was also made more interesting before Chris Klein even spoke on Tuesday, though, because they have Jake Rubley or Avery Johnson as the number two. What's your takeaway from what we saw in the depth chart and what we heard from Chris Klein in regards to quarterback number two? His answer kind of took me aback a little bit, to be quite honest, because uh, not that I – expected to them to maybe deliver a plan at this point or because look at it the way this last week last year when they we, he was asked this he's like if a helmet pops off it's so and so if it's you know long term it's it's probably will howard because they're protecting his red shirt this year he's re- chris cloud is very coy about that and it was my question i wasn't meaning to ask something uh that i thought to be controversial but I thought he was very guarded. Probably that was where he was the most guarded throughout the entire press conference, saying that we don't have a plan. We're going to play it as we go. Uh, we got Will Howard, and we'll go from there. Um, which, yeah, just not really being divulgent about that while being pretty transparent on just about every other topic. It's in- interesting to me. It's either they don't have necessarily that approach pinned down yet or – you know, it's maybe a little bit of a touchy subject. I don't, I don't know. It's because it's interesting to me on because of that, but also because I think it was about two weeks ago when we spoke to offensive coordinator Colin Klein after our practice, and he was, you know, not necessarily hiding anything. He said Jake Rubley was the number two quarterback. Um, then we get the depth chart, as you said, and it's Jake Rubley or Avery Johnson, which you know that's fine. I'm not, I'm not really criticizing or judging anything that they have done. I'm just my curiosity has peaked at this point because of all these 
angles that have kind of been delivered to us to absorb and digest and consume because I mean, the easiest thing in the world, and they had the out to do it, was to not really include Avery Johnson on the first step chart. They didn't have to do that. They did it for a reason. Um, either he's by and large, far and away, just outstanding, and it would be almost intellectually dishonest to the entire team if they didn't include him, or you know, something's going on. So I think that Avery Johnson is probably way ahead of schedule to the point where they just couldn't not include him on the depth chart. So um what happens what they do in certain situations whether it's jay gribbler or avery johnson is my curiosity is very much peaked um and i think avery johnson's really really pushing hard right now and almost probably to the point at least this is how i interpret it by reading between the lines it's like like he's too good not to play um it really feels like that at least with the ball in his hands whether it's a runner you know all these things that doesn't mean he's going to play like nine, 10 games and have a special package for him every game. Because to be honest, well, if, if Will Howard's as good as we think he is, it, it's hard to take Will Howard off the field. I hate having two quarterbacks on the field at the same time too. I think that's also a bunch of silliness. Then you have the problem when you're interrupting, disrupting a rhythm of a starting quarterback. That's really got, got it going. I, I think it's going to be hard to play Avery Johnson at the same time. I think it's going to be hard not to play them judging by everything that they've kind of, you know, done throughout the off season. So in a word, I would say that I think all three are going to play on Saturday. And I think the Bill Snyder family stand will probably light up pretty. There'll be, there'll be a crowd pop when Avery hits the field for the first time. And, and I said this on the, the three mile pod preview podcast that will go out, you know, at some point, but like, Jake Rubel used to be the guy, so he'll probably understand it, but he's going to have to have some thick skin because he's going to get a probably a little dose of reality on Saturday, what the different kinds of reactions. You know, one of the things that you, you said there that I think stands out to me is, uh, hey, there's no reason to have two quarterbacks on the field. It's kind of silly, and – Good thing is we know nobody in the state of Kansas is doing that. Nobody's taking a talented quarterback off the field or putting another quarterback onto the field with them. So I mean, we can at least get that out of the way there. Uh, here's how I interpret the situation at, at quarterback and how it's played out is I think D-Wise got a little bit of internet trouble right now. But it's either one of two things. Either number one, it's like you're saying Avery Johnson has pushed so well and he's so advanced at this point that he is in a good position, he is ready to go, and he he truly is pushing for a legit number two spot or at least in the mix to be utilized. Or it is the inverse of that, and and I really don't think it's this, but it's something that has to be considered just, you know, in case. But it's the – you have to play some politics here because he is the star freshman that's coming in, and you have to, you know, give a little something. And so he's just there by name and value of, of the stars next to him. I don't think that's the case, though. I, I think it certainly seems like it is on the other side of things where it definitely comes down to, hey, Avery Johnson has started to add the weight. He's done the physical stuff they needed him to. They already knew that he had the, the quarterback talent and the athleticism to play at this level. And now he's putting more and more of it together from the mental side, too. And he's absolutely earned to be in that or position. So we'll see how things end up, you know, kind of advancing uh, throughout the season with the Avery Johnson situation. I don't know how much of it you heard. I know you said beforehand we were having Internet troubles, but real quick, I'll recap for you, D-Way. I, th- the way I see it with the, the two quarterbacks behind Will Howard is this. It's either it is Avery Johnson that has really pushed and advanced himself so far already that they have to put him in that spot and they see the potential and they like what he could do. And he's legitimately possibly their quarterback number two, or it's the other side of it. And I really doubt it's this because of the type of guy that Avery Johnson is and the way that Chris Kleiman's staff is, but it would just be one of those deals where you say, Hey, he's the, the stud quarterback freshman. We just brought in the crown jewel of recruiting for the last, however many years for K state, Let's put him on the depth chart. We kind of have to play the politicky game. I really don't think it's that, though. I really think it's Avery Johnson has been impressive enough for these guys to say, hey, he, he could be the number two, but Jake Rubley has obviously proven himself. And I think that they probably feel good about what Jake Rubley could do if he was put onto the field. Because um, last year against TCU, that was kind of his, his Will Howard, you know, early Will Howard, where you just got fed to the wolves in a bad situation. So 
I- I'm intrigued nonetheless, and it'll be interesting to see who the not named Will Howard is to step onto the field on Saturday. Yeah, or who the first one is, uh, and if that's a if that's a you know an indication of anything one way or the other. I agree. I don't think just knowing Avery Johnson that it, this is really a politicky game. Even if it was, I'm not sure that the Kansas State coaches are the type that would be really willing to play it. To be quite honest, so yeah. I don't think it's one way or the other. I do think it's probably a pretty tight battle to the point where Jake Ribley hasn't done anything wrong um, to not get that opportunity, and, and Avery Johnson's probably done everything right to you know give a shot because he can really help the team win. So it could be really as you know. This is why I think all three quarterbacks are going to play on Saturday. I think they want to see how each of Jake Ribley and Avery Johnson respond, and hopefully they'll get the opportunity to do that. Obviously, they got to smoke Semo to to really be able to do that. I mean, SEMO was a good FCS team last year and a not so good Iowa State offense beat them like 42 to 10. So well, yeah. I have confidence that K State can put them away. From from a ranking and, and caliber and profile standpoint, I, I've kind of, they are there along the lines of what Kansas State saw with Nichols and Chris Kleiman's first year. Yeah. And we would think that this is a better team than the 2019 team, which was pretty good. So we'll see. Two final things to get to, I think, are interesting from a, you know, K State standpoint that were brought up. Probably not as important as the injuries in the quarterback situation. But the first one is the balance at running back that we might see between DJ Giddens and Treshawn Ward. Both very capable running backs, both guys that K State fans are really excited to see out there. And this is kind of more what Chris Kleiman and his teams at North Dakota State were like, where they had multiple running backs that were going to get close to equal numbers and be out there multiple times. Deuce Vaughn forced his hand to have just the one-star running back situation because he was that good. Um, How do you expect the balance of DJ Giddens and Treshawn Ward to play out based off of what Chris Kleiman said? Uh, Based off what Chris Kleiman said, it'll probably be on a game-to-game basis and maybe look differently from one game to another based on my interpretation and gut feeling and instinct, uh, I would say the same thing. Look, it's probably, if it's as hard for me to do it from this far away, it's probably tough for them to do it when they are as close to it. It's just Treshawn Ward by all intents and purposes is going to be a really, really good player for Kansas state and was at Florida state last year. I mean, he crushed Oklahoma in the bowl game. If you, if you want to go look at that tape, you look really impressive, very dynamic, probably something that Kansas State doesn't have in the backfield that he can provide. And DJ Giddens, that's probably your budding star. Like, right, He's could be the next big deal. It, when Treshawn Ward's eligibility expires or he chooses to go on and give give the NFL a try, I mean, it would not shock me. Now, Joe Jackson could be pretty good and really force his hand into the rotation at some point, like really squarely. But DJ Giddens is, is good enough to, to kind of force his way into that dominant role uh being the lead bell cow like you kind of mentioned that deuce bond did i mean i think he's that good or will be that good and again starting to slow down for him a little bit and he understands what it takes uh to be successful on saturdays and it's not just showing up on saturdays and 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 relying on your raw talent which i think he was always able to do at junction city and then i guess probably thought maybe that's how it would be at every level but the you know where you can tell that he's made the biggest steps in development and maybe maturation was when I asked him on Tuesday because he was available to the media. One, just how much more comfortable he was with the media. I think we spoke to him once last year. might have been after the Iowa State game, I want to say. And that was a guy who was that really – that wasn't his calling, right? He didn't want to be in the media. His answers were pretty short. It was definitely not something that – uh, he really wanted to do. Now, he probably didn't want to do it on Tuesday either, let's be honest, but he was much more comfortable, gave a lot better answers. You could tell that the, the game has slowed down for him. But the biggest thing is when I asked him what he learned the most from Deuce Vaughn, it wasn't you know this particular trait or, or this particular skill or you know doing this in, in this moment or how to read a defense. It was none of that, although that all probably goes into what his answer was. His answer was, having the mindset and the approach and attacking preparation Monday through Friday. Like you can't just show up on Saturday and expect to be great. Um, what he learned the most from Deuce Vaughn was what Deuce Vaughn was on Saturday was a product of what he did in terms of recovery, uh, preparation, just everything that went into it from Monday through Friday. So Deuce Vaughn, 
um, obviously made a large impact on DJ Giddens because now he's understanding that, you know, it's not just about Saturday. It's also about Monday through Friday. And, and I think that's a big thing. So now the question was about running back distribution. I really don't know how it's going to look. I, I mean, Chris Kleiman even mentioned something about a hot hand. I think that's, I think that's definitely possible. I definitely don't want to disrupt any rhythm that might be had by someone. I, the only thing that I think that I would feel comfortable with saying is that I think DJ Giddens is the perfect fourth quarter running back that where he, he's already splitting the carries and touches a little bit and, and snaps with Trayshawn Ward. So he's still going to be pretty fresh in the fourth quarter. He's a downhill physical bruiser. And when you can use that to really ice a game, really use that returning the entire returning offensive line and really lean on a defense, I think that really comes into play at the end of games. Yeah, I, I think it, it seems like it's pretty dead even. My guess is at the end of the year when we look at it, they both probably hit similar numbers in terms of yardage, but DJ Gins will just have a few more carries because of the nature of the type of back he is. Like we'll probably see more 50 yard runs or, you know, explosive runs of 20, 25 yards from Trayshawn Ward than DJ Giddens, even though they both have it in them. But I think that end of the year, the numbers probably end up looking pretty similar. And I doubt either guy gets to the end of the season and feels like they were slided or didn't get what they wanted out of 2023. Final thing to hit on from yesterday. Maybe it matters. Maybe it doesn't. But it's been a fascinating topic for going on a third season now is the kicking situation at K-State. 2021 started, Tate and Winkle was the starting kicker. Then midway through the year, Chris Tennant, very talented freshman, took over, had the leg, everything else. But, you know, a couple of misses. Last year it got really shaky at times, and a change had to be made after the TCU game in Fort Worth. It obviously paid off. Ty Zentner was awesome. He parlayed it into NFL opportunity, more so as a punter, but he was great for K-State last year. Now Chris Tennant gets a chance again, it would seem, but – it's kind of fascinating to hear Chris Kleiman be kind of so honest yes, yesterday where it, it wasn't always going to be Chris Tennant at, at one point this summer maybe and that he was able to kind of earn his way back and win that job back to start the season. Yeah, it was clear uh, according to head coach Chris Kleiman that even when we spoke to him a couple of weeks ago or it might have been about 10 days ago that Chris Tennant kind of had to play catch up to win this kicking job. Uh, now – I would have been surprised if that was the case. So I am stunned because I thought Chris Tennant's way too talented, um, too strong of a leg, too massive of a leg to not get another second chance. I mean, look at the second chances that have been afforded to other players in this program, and they have ran with it with flying colors. Will Howard's a perfect example. I mean, yeah, um, of guys that you know struggle in the early going, and kickers are really fickle in general. A lot of kickers actually don't do great. There's a there's a litany of NFL kickers that have had struggles in college, to be quite honest. So it's a, it's a mental game. It's like it's like maybe you with your putter at some point, right? Or Scotty Scheffler right now with this putter, uh, if you're a big golf fan. He's he's probably Tiger Woods-esque tee to green, but he can't putt to save his life. And because of that, he's not winning any tournaments, even though he's probably has 10 strokes on the field just in every other category. So it's one of those things where if something gets inside your head, you're going to crumble. Um, I would have given Chris Tennant the job no matter what because I think he's he's too good not to have gotten that second chance maybe Leighton Simmering was that going to be the answer at one point but uh and good on the Kansas State coaches made him go out and earn that second chance to be quite honest and he certainly did and he came from behind throughout training camp and sound like it was a photo finish but Chris Tennant won the job again and you know I understand the consternation from from fans, from media about whether or not this is going to work. We've seen Chris Tennant's inconsistencies, and think, you know it really impacted the game last year against I think TCU and Fort Worth. Some of those mm-hmm. field goals that were missed uh, that could have been capitalized. You wonder how things look if you're making those field goals, or if Ty Zentner is the kicker in those situations because he went on to replace Chris Tennant and, and didn't miss, but. In my opinion, Chris Tennant has done everything to to earn this second chance. He's too talented, and and if I was a betting man, I would put on it that Chris Tennant, you know, has a sensational season and, and it's the kicker for multiple seasons. So I I just feel that way because he's too good. I mean, he's too good. Uh, yeah, it, it. I've always thought it was mental for him, and I think Chris Kleiman basically confirmed it as such. Um, you know, call it yips, call it whatever you want, but I think it, it's more in his head than anything because I think he's capable capable of being one of the best kickers and you know, the Kansas State's ever had. He's that good. And and why I think it's kind of 
more psychological than anything. It's like you almost see him like when he's in warmups, just letting it rip, just bombing it right. And and then when you see him kick field goals, it's almost like he's really guiding the ball or trying to, and, and slows his leg down when he's ripping it through and not just let letting it fly. And I think Chris Kleiman alluded to that at times last year, but. In my opinion, uh, Chris Tennant deserves the second chance, and I hope he capitalizes on it. I think he will. Yeah, that well, that basically answers my last question for you, which is going to be like, if you had to put a percentage on your confidence level in Chris Tennant right now, where would it be? But it's pretty high, so I don't know that you need to give a, a specific yeah. number there. And maybe it's one of those deals for Chris Tennant where it took kind of bottoming out, you know, mentally with the kicking game to start to build himself back up and be able to repair that because you're right. Like there is serious talent there and it's just got to be one of those things that finally it clicks. And once it does, it should go pretty easy for him. Yeah. And you, it'll be interesting. Like your backs against now his backs against the wall a little bit. You got nothing to lose. Does that make, does that really turn loose his talent and he really takes off from here? Or does he realize this is probably a short leash and get a little, you know, hesitant because of that uh i hope he just lets it rip because you know he should know it but i mean everyone in the stadium knows how good he is now he just has to believe that yep well that that is uh that is a big question that's one of the things i'm most interested in because believe it or not one of my favorite things when i'm playing madden is kicking and punting because it is challenge in those games and i for some reason i just enjoy it so i'm always fascinated when you have a struggling kicker and seeing how that plays out because there will be undoubtedly a game this year where it's important, like TCU last year. A couple of those kicks go down. It's a it's a much different game in case they can handle that second half a little bit differently, even with the Will Howard injury that still came into play. So that will do it for this edition of the Kito Show. Plenty more content coming this week and for the rest of the season. So be sure to, to follow along, whether it's on, on three with K-State Online or on the K-State Online YouTube page and every other element. And you can be sure to find us on Twitter as well. And uh, that'll do it for this edition of our little recap of Chris Kleiman's press conference. First one of the year. We'll be back with this same edition of a show next week. We'll have more shows this week and post game on Saturday.